Uh, hi, I'm Janet, and I'm here to talk about coyotes. But first, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming. And I also want to thank Judy and Joe and especially Otman for inviting me here and for setting up this meeting. So thank you all. Before I begin, a little bit about myself. I'm a self-taught naturalist who's been documenting coyote behavior here in San Francisco every day for the last 13 years. Specifically, I look at their individual behaviors, what they're doing and why, and of course, they're always doing something, their family life and their interactions with pets and people. And I always begin by figuring out who each coyote is as an individual. I tell them apart by their faces, each is unique, as you can see in these photos, and the differences go deeper into their various personalities, which become obvious by comparing and contrasting them. So for example, some are going to be much more curious and investigative, whereas others are going to be much more cautious and careful. Some are going to be very playful and gregarious uh, and love to tease, whereas others are going to be much more serious, watchful and withdrawn. Then on top of their personality differences, their different social situations also distinguish them. And these evolve over their lifetimes. So they all start out as pups with siblings in families on territories in very stable situations. And then most move on to becoming interloping loners without territories and without social networks. So it's a complete change for them. Eventually they find mates and they become parents and defenders of their own territories. And then at some point they get old and they lose their mates and they lose uh, or leave their territories. So each situation engenders different behaviors, all of which go to define who the coyotes are and which differentiate them. Then in addition to their behaviors, I also look at their population dynamics and I collect scat for DNA analysis at UC Davis, where I'm collaborating in a citywide uh, population study. And here is a summary poster with some of my contributions so far, and one conclusion which I will share with you in just a few minutes. So that's what I do. And now let's move on to the coyotes, where I'll be using my own first-hand observations and my own maps, photos, and videos of those observations to tell you about them, with a few exceptions. Okay, we're going to cover three points in about 40 minutes, uh, beginning with their population structure and distribution. We're going to move on to uh, family life, and then we'll end with stewardship and guidelines for coexistence. And we're going to begin with their population. Where in the world do coyotes live? They live only here in America. They are native only to the Americas. Since the 1750s, they've expanded their range from the Midwest to the entire North American continent where they, where they inhabit every state now except Hawaii. And they've been able to do so in the last 200 years in part because we exterminated their main uh, predator, the wolf and by uh, killing it outright and by removing its woodland habitat and replacing it with our vast farmlands. There are 19 subspecies of coyotes running from this 35 to 50 pound Eastern coyote found on the East Coast of the US and sometimes called a coy wolf to this 19 pound coyote in Florida, which sometimes can be melanistic or black as you see here to our very own little Western coyote weighing between 25 and 35 pounds and uh, averaging about 30 pounds. Just during the last 20 years, coyotes have moved more and more into cities and urban areas where they claim territories in parks, in open spaces and in some of the neighborhoods. Habitat is chosen for its protective cover for food and water availability, and maybe for a hillside with a view. So prime real estate for coyotes includes Telegraph Hill and St. Francis Woods, among other neighborhoods, and most of the parks 
where, by the way, our spigots, ponds, and hoses are important water sources for them. How did coyotes get to San Francisco? DNA analyzed by Professor ben Benjamin Sachs at UC Davis shows that the first coyotes to reappear here in San Francisco in 2002, after many years of absence, came from the north, giving rise to the speculation that they trotted over the Golden Gate Bridge. But nobody has seen a coyote uh, trot the whole span of the bridge. And actually, there was no population pressure nor food pressure in Marin to push them over here. And ecologists I've spoken to are skeptical of that idea. A much less popular and certainly less romantic story is that a trapper brought them in. Posting this on my blog brought a response from none other than an associate of that trapper who verified the story and actually witnessed one of the releases. So based on my scat collecting to date, Professor Sachs has determined that our current population of 60 to 100 coyotes all came from just four original founding coyotes. Uh, and that's the conclusion I wanted to share from that earlier poster with you. By the way, coyotes have always lived close to human habitation in this area. They mingled among the Ohlone Indians before the Spaniards came. Coyotes in San Francisco are not wandering around haphazardly nor multiplying wildly as some people think. This map or partial map uh, based on my own observation shows how the population is divided and situated into discrete family units on distinct territories with fairly exact borders. Only one coyote family and no other coyotes appear on any one territory. You'll see these family members trekking routinely through their areas, which include the surrounding neighborhoods as they visit and among other things, mark their territories in order to keep other coyotes out. Rarely, you'll see a dispersing outsider passing through quickly and quietly. And here is a dispersing youngster on the right being repulsed by a territorial owner. And even more rarely, you'll see a dispersing youngster allowed to stay for several weeks uh, before moving on. And this is what happened right here on Goat Hill in August. Uh, the youngster is the bigger coyote in the back. Uh, he's bigger, but not wiser. In fact, he was probably killed three months ago by a car. More sightings don't necessarily equal more coyotes. Rather, more people than ever are out noticing them because shelter in place encourages park visits and hanging around home where the coyotes are. Also, over the last few years, social media has allowed a lot more sharing of sightings, unfortunately, also with a lot more misinformation. Individual families then own these territories and all the resources on the territories, and they keep other coyotes out, reserving those resources just for themselves. And this is what their territoriality is about. And of course, keeping other coyotes out limits the population in any area. The territories I've worked out here in San Francisco run between one and a half and two and a half square miles. And here's that map again showing that. Most territories include an, uh, an alpha parent pair and their youngsters. Alpha parent pairs provide long-term stability to the Aries population, whereas their offspring inevitably move on. I've seen territories occupied for as long as 13 years and still running. Older alphas may abandon their long-term territories after losing a territorial battle, or even without such provocation, possibly because their reproductive um, years were over. And that's what happened right here on Goat Hill last year. These were your alphas until last year. So territoriality limits the population, but so does the fact that only uh, the two alphas on any territory reproduce. Remember, the youngsters leave. And this is how it happens here. A mother wallops her yearling daughter to either disperse her or to instill fear in her so that she won't reproduce.
So all the other coyotes there are male. That was the mother uh, walloping her daughter. And the other thing I wanted you to notice was the raspy vocalizations, which I'll get back to in a minute. So coyote population is self-regulating. Younger females are referred to as behaviorally sterile. Culling disrupts this process, so they'll produce more litters and eventually make up the difference. So you want a stable family in your area. And this, what I just told you, is based on a 1972 study by F.F. F. Knowlton. Continuing with their population, pups are born just once a year in the springtime, which distinguishes them from dogs who have a twice a year reproductive cycle. Litter size averages three or four, but I've seen as few as one and even none, and uh, as many as seven pups born. And they have a fairly low survival rate, though in the city it's uh, uh, higher than in the um, rural areas. Dens are used only for the pupping season. Then just like bird nests or our own cradles, these are soon outgrown and abandoned to sleep out in the open, usually in hidden places. And here are some dens for you to see under trees or rocks, which could be expansions from pre-existing burrows of other animals, or they dig their own dens from scratch, and they've even denned under our porches. Territory population then grows during the pupping season, but shrinks back down to just the alpha pair with possibly one or two yearlings lingering a little longer before uh, moving on. Pups normally disperse sometime in their second year. Uh, they're either driven out by a parent or a sibling as in this photograph here, or they leave when their time uh, clocks tell them, hey, it's time to go. Uh, hold on. Dispersal is a dangerous time for coyotes due to traffic, hostile coyotes, and simply being in unfamiliar territory. Cars are their main killers in cities. Uh, ACC picks up at least 10 every year, just killed by cars. So discreetly and under cover of darkness, they search for their own territories. And here are some dispersal directions and destinations that I've tracked. Many or most seem to move south and out of the city. A buff pair might fight for a territory where they detect weak alphas. And a lucky coyote might just find a vacated niche uh, right here in the city. So this next map details uh, many months crisscrossing of vast distances of a dispersing coyote. And this next map shows the journey's end and how she sticks to her territory without moving uh, out of it. Actually, she stays in the territory. So those last two Presidio maps depict radio collar information. Of the 15 coyotes tagged and collared in the Presidio over a three-year span, all were killed by cars except one. That's a 93.3% death rate. Um, and I wonder, was tagging a factor in that many deaths? Simple observations, as you see in this presentation, I think yield uh, much more information than things from collars. Few people think about this, but coyotes get old. They get hard of hearing, hard of seeing, arthritic and tired. Life becomes more difficult as they age. I see coyotes out much less often as they get older. Sadly, many don't live to be a ripe old age. Their natural lifespan during captivity is 14 to 16 years. But in reality, in the wild wild, I'm told, they live three to five years. In urban areas, those that survive puppyhood do live longer. And I've known a couple of 12 year olds uh, who I no longer see anymore. And I know an 11 and a half year old who I hadn't been seeing for uh, two months, but he surfaced again, so he's still kicking. Regarding disease and injury, I've not seen mange or rabies here in San Francisco, but I've seen a variety of parasites and diarrhea. I've seen wounds from hunting and wounds from territorial battles, and I've seen lots and lots of limping due, due to having been chased by dogs. 
So let's talk for a minute about our Goat Hill Coyotes. Here is mom back in 2018 lactating. Therefore, she's the alpha here. I believe this was her last litter. She was the alpha here until last year. This is her litter born in 2017, the year before that last photo was taken. There were seven pups born that year uh, initially, but two were poisoned by car coolant that somebody left out and another was killed by a car. So these four that you see here remained hidden in the grasses in the front is the only female of that litter. And here they are again, and that female is over to the right. Notice how well camouflaged they are. And here's a better view of her as a pup. And here she is close to three years later as an adult. The photo on the left was taken in April, and you can see that she's lactating. The photo to the right is her mate. These then are our alphas here on uh, Goat Hill now. They produced three pups uh, this last year, two that we've identified, a male and a female. And the third, um, I haven't seen, and it may no longer be around. So the coyotes born in 2017 here on Goat Hill are already leaving their mark. Each of those four youngsters has successfully branched out and become the alpha of its own territory. Counterclockwise, you have Puff, who went to the Presidio, Hunter, who went to St. Francis Woods, Blondie, who went to Land's End, and then Kai, too, who left but came back and uh, became the alpha here. Uh, the smaller circles are their mates. And here are their general dispersal directions. You have Puff, who went to uh, uh, the Presidio, then you have, uh, who's that again? Hunter and Blondie. And here is Kai Tu who left and then came back. And here are their locations. So by all accounts, this family from uh, Hoyt Tower has been extremely successful. So that covers their population, where they live, their population density, their life cycle, and a little bit about our Goat Hill Coyotes. And now let's move on to uh, coyote family life and interactions. A defining characteristic of coyotes is their family life. They are extremely social. They famously mate for life. A family usually consists of a male and a female and usually pups and or yearlings who soon leave the area. And this picture right here is uh, um, of such a traditional family but there are variations on the theme. Here is a single mom and two sons. She remained single for three years and eventually um, took one of her sons as her mate. Here is a loner uh, who remained a loner. Uh, she owned her own territory, but remained a loner for four years before she found a mate and had a family. This is a temporary pairing that lasted only five months and was disrupted by an intruder. Uh, here you have three siblings who remain together as a family without an alpha pair. Uh, however, there was a hierarchy between them. And then lastly, here is a recombined or reconfigured family consisting of a dad to the right a son to the left and an adopted yearling female from another family. Dad's mate left him to pair up with another male. Yes, a divorce, which is unusual for coyotes, likely provoked by human um, interference by feeding them. So you are unlikely to see very young pups in these family groups that you see because they are kept well hidden until um, the pups are larger in size. So these coyote family units of related individuals are not like packs of stray dogs, which are unrelated individuals and behave more like gangsters. And this picture is actually uh, the only dog pack I could find. And it's from India. I don't think we allow such uh, dog packs in the US anymore. So um, 
On the contrary, coyote families are orderly and organized. There are hierarchies and discipline. Here, one is disciplining another by grabbing its snout. It's a little bit like a uh, hand slap. In fact, even their days are somewhat organized. After sleeping during the day, usually in separate locations, their activity generally begins in the evening at their rendezvous, where they meet and greet and interact. There can be lots of excitement and lots of squealing. It's a little bit like a party. And then after the rendezvous, they trek through their territories beyond the parks where they hunt, patrol, and mark their territories in order to keep other coyotes out, and they continue to socialize. Being in the neighborhoods is not wayward be behavior. They care for each other through mutual grooming, like removing ticks for each other, as in this photo. And here's more unusual caring behavior, helping a mate in danger or in pain. The male to the left suffered a broken ankle when dogs chased him. And afterwards, uh, this is a couple of days later, his mate prods him to move away from the area where dogs might continue to chase him. They cuddle and greet each other with wiggles and squiggles and joyous jumps and body hugs. There's lots of intimacy between them. Hold on. They tease, uh, they tease and horse around all the time. Here, one coyote slipped under another, lifting her on his back where she dangled for a moment. So they can be very funny. They love to play tricks on each other. To the left, mom teasingly swipes a rat from her son, uh, inspiring a game of chase. And another trick is to spy on and then steal something buried by another coyote and hide it somewhere just for yourself. So they are tricksters and maybe this is why. Poking, pulling, and provocative nipping are all part of their mostly goodwill teasing. And here is that in action. <laughs> There's lots of excitement when they play. They love a three-way tug of war. And as they run around rambunctiously, they'll leap over each other and even onto each other in their excitement. Even older adult parents love to play like pups. This is their quality time and it reaffirms their bonds. Here, dad teasingly twists and turns, inciting mom to react. And here he jokingly and affectionately pinches her leg as they run along together. Her smile shows just how much fun she's having. These are eight-year-old parents with a brand new litter tucked into the bushes uh, about 200 yards away. Pop on pop, dad is important. Both parents raise the young in coyote families and this is not very common in the mammal world. At times, there's friction in families, just like in our own. Here, two brothers who used to be best buddies uh, are now squabbling. One or both will soon disperse because this kind of uh, disruptive behavior is not tolerated. Coyotes can act rejected and sad when they are taunted, excluded, or shunned. Their feelings can be intense and are very obvious when you're watching them. The rest of this section now is going to be about communication behavior. Communication, of course, is another way of interacting. Coyotes communicate constantly through eye contact. They're always aware of each other's moods and intentions. Most of their communication is silent like this through body language. The flip side is that facing away purposefully blocks out communication from a taunting sibling, something we might do. Communication does include sounds. When they are noisy, they are very noisy. And I'm gonna show you three examples here, beginning with family howls. Coyotes respond to sirens as here, uh, and I have cut the sirens out to shorten this video, possibly to express their family unity and their territorial separateness from neighboring coyotes. And you'll see that this evening howling session segues into that exciting family rendezvous I told you about earlier. 
the party begins. Next is social vocalizing of a mated pair. I think you'll agree that this one sounds very conversational. Possibly they're uh, conveying their locations, how they're doing, and maybe that it's time for the evening meetup. That's the female. That's the male. Lastly, I'll show you distressed howling after having been chased by a dog. Coyotes hate to be chased by dogs. She's upset and venting, letting the world know how she feels. This can go on for over half an hour. Um, a couple of her family members are close by. They did not react. I don't think this is a communication here. This is simply venting. Uh, I want you to notice how barky and raspy this sound is compared to the previous ones you heard. Summarizing then, their sounds range from raspy growls, snarls, and the barks you just heard, uh, which show they are upset, angry, or they use these as a warning, to the sing-songy friendly howls, yips, whines, and squeals you heard in that family recording. Uh, use of lips and tongues allow modulations, as you heard in that conversational recording. Then in addition, their ability to create a variety of sounds often cause just a few coyotes to sound like many more than there really are. Also, unique howl patterns identify each coyote and I can identify some in the distance. And I have never heard coyotes howl at a kill. A lot of people believe that's what's happening, but I think it's a, a misconception. I don't think they would want to advertise a kill. So that covers their family life and interactions, showing just how social they are and including their communication. And now let's move on to stewardship and guidelines for coexistence. Coyotes are very wrapped up in their own family lives and socialized lives as, as you have just seen. They are mostly, but not entirely active in the evening, darker hours when we mostly aren't around. Larger dogs can be threatening to them and smaller dogs are vulnerable. The biggest urban coyote issue is pets. Dogs and coyotes do not like each other and small pets look like food. Three triggers often cause a coyote to react to your pet. First proximity offers both coyotes and pets opportunities to interact usually negatively. Let's not offer them these opportunities. Please keep pets away from them. The farther, the better. Always walk away from a coyote uh, uh, when you see one, the minute you see one. Coyotes hunt, of course. 
uh, very small pets are vulnerable. Coyotes don't know who is a pet and who isn't. How would they know this? We need to keep pets at a distance and supervise pets in yards, especially small ones. Uh, please remember coyotes can jump a six foot fence. Thirdly, their territoriality, which we've already talked about, is behind most of their antagonism with dogs, as it is with other coyotes. Territoriality, again, is ownership. It's to ensure that the finite resources there are just for them. And it also provides a sanctuary for raising pups. How do they enforce their territoriality? They message dogs and intruder coyotes to leave them and their areas alone. And this is how they message the dogs. Through eye contact and facial expressions, through body language, including scraping or kicking the ground angrily. And they may up the ante by charging and nipping the haunches or back legs of a dog, cattle dog fashion, to get that dog to leave. Most dogs react to a coyote by, react, by uh, barking at it, lunging, or chasing. We need to prevent these by leashing and walking away to prevent an escalation. Here is more messaging through body language towards a dog. Notice the hair pinned arched back, the gaping, and there is hissing going on. These are distinctly not dog behaviors. They are specific to coyotes and much more cat-like. So please remember their aim isn't to maul your dog. It's to get your dog to leave. Very small dogs are a different issue. And dogs communicate in their own subtle ways to other dogs and to coyotes, most of which is below our radar until it's too late. You can minimize negative communication by keeping far away from any uh, coyote in the first place and moving away from it the minute you see it. Intense commun uh, coyote communication, even to a leash dog, can be frightening if you don't know what's going on. And here's an instance of a mother coyote approaching a leash dog. You'll see that angry kicking, uh, then you'll see messaging and escorting behavior, uh, and you'll hear that raspy barking. The trigger here is proximity. The dog owner here doesn't know what's going on and she does, has no idea what to do. She thought the coyote wanted to play or was even looking for a mate. You'll see that I stop the video at a certain point to let the, the lady know uh, what she should do uh, and what the coyote wants. And when she does that, the coyote moves on. So few dogs are going to be as calm as the dog you're going to be seeing in this video. Most dogs, again, are going to bark at, lunge at, or chase a coyote. Please move away from a coyote always. <laughs> Then in addition to this escorting behavior, which you just saw, a coyote could also follow a dog out of simple curiosity or to monitor it the same way you might monitor a suspect prowling through your neighborhood. Just keep walking away from the coyote, picking up a small dog as you go uh, without running, dragging your larger dog if you have to and keeping your eye on that coyote. You may try scaring the coyote off if it comes critically close, but the main thing is to keep moving away from that coyote. That's what the coyote wants. 
pesting is a little bit different from messaging and again, not so common. Curious coyotes may test or assess how a dog will react to them by approaching with a little bouncy gait and try to interact, touch or nip the dog's tail. Pull your dog away and keep walking away to end this behavior. In a totally different vein, too much love is just as harmful to coyotes as a culture of fear. In some pockets of San Francisco, the pendulum has swung from fear to too much love for coyotes through feeding, coupled with befriending, approaching, and attempting to communicate or even prolong mutual visual contact. This human engagement over time can break down natural safety barriers, causing a coyote to hang around listlessly, chase cars, approach, and beg. It's best not, it's best to love their wildness uh, always at a distance and maybe just out of the corner of your eye. Feeding coyotes robs them of their wariness and makes them docile. They become more strong, uh, stray dog-like and nuisances, hanging out in the street where their lives are endangered and where there's more likely to be conflict with pets. And a coyote with a little more sass could become demanding with a bite. This is what they do to their parents when their parents stop feeding them. There's a little nip they give the, the parent. So this is last year's alpha mom begging in the middle of the street, stopping traffic and looking up to the third floor apartment where her feeder lives. Here's that same coyote who has been tossed food uh, by somebody in a paper bag. And this fella sat regularly for eight hours at a stretch on a busy path at Lake Merced, waiting for his regular feeder and anybody else who would toss food to him. This simply is not natural coyote behavior. It's totally caused by humans. The coyote to the left has been thrown food from cars. She's now in the street chasing after cars regularly. Coyotes and children, um, coyotes are unpredictable and so are children. It's not a good combination. Young children have been bitten by coyotes reacting to their quick motions and small size. Please keep children away from coyotes no matter how docile that animal appears. The good news is that issues are very easy to resolve with minimal effort. Foremost, please practice complete avoidance no matter how far or near a coyote is. Leash your dog the minute you see a coyote and walk away from it without running. Pick up a small dog as you walk away. It's not a good idea to allow pets to roam free in coyote areas. Prevent your dog from chasing coyotes. Almost all unleashed dogs chase coyotes. Once a dog has begun to chase, it's really hard to call him back. An alpha coyote could return the favor, chase back and message the dog with a nip. Keep food of any kind out of your yard if you don't want coyotes visiting. Adults may scare a coyote away from a yard by by uh, banging pots and pans and walking towards the coyote without getting too close and never, um, never cornering that coyote. Only adults should ever do that. So stewardship and guidelines, safety guidelines are two sides of the same coin. We humans shape who the coyotes become. It takes a village to do it right. Please don't feed the coyotes it's actually illegal and could bring a $1,000 fine. And please become an ambassador for them by spreading proper guidelines and the reasons for their guidelines, which are here on this card uh, to keep them wild, safe, and trouble-free. Never feed, always leash and walk away. Don't approach, befriend, or interact with them. Keep your distance, and I'm suggesting 75 feet and scare them off if they approach you by approaching them menacingly, meanly, and loudly. Get out of here. In the public realm, the state of California and city of San Francisco support coexistence through education. They've deemed coyotes not risky, 
relocation is illegal and not an option. The news media and next door have been uh, have not been very helpful. They've been largely sensationalist, fear provoking, and lacking a base of knowledge for their postings and reports, often amplifying fears unnecessarily rather than alleviating them. Risks of injury from a coyote are extremely rare, and here are some comparisons for you. 5,000 people a year get killed crossing a street, whereas only two deaths of humans from coyotes have been recorded ever in all time. And that includes a two-year-old whose neighbor had been feeding a coyote. 1,000 dog bites every single day send people to emergency rooms, whereas bites and scratches from coyotes to humans amount to 17 a year for all of North America, almost all due to breaking up a uh, dog coyote encounter, hand feeding, or to a very young unsupervised child. Pets need to be protected from many dangers. 5.4 million cats are killed each year by cars. 1.2 million dogs are killed each year by cars. And dog bites to other pets is the third largest injury to pets. Potential danger uh, from a coyote is relatively minor. Uh, simple precautions can avert almost all potential incidents. Again, the number of dog-dog ego conflicts dwarfs the number of dog-coyote territorial battles. Rabies in coyotes is rare. Only 0.2% of all reported cases were rabies in 2010, and I haven't seen any exact figures since then. They weren't even on the CDC charts in 2017 or 2018, which showed that bats accounted for 32% of those cases, raccoons 28%, skunks 21%, and foxes 7%. Please know that coyotes mitigate rabies by predation on the species that carry the disease. So we have now covered where coyotes are, who they are, and how to get along. Thank you for listening and learning. And now it's your turn for questions and comments. Um, Otman is going to have to yeah. re- Yeah. 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 Very much. You were, that was fabulous. We have uh, some really positive comments already. Um, I have a question from Yasmin. Um, she said, "What does it mean when an intruder interrupts a mating?" When a, an intruder interrupts a meeting. A mating. Yeah. Oh, like another animal, or like another coyote. I'm assuming so. Well, um, I know that most. Females have like three to seven suitors. She chooses who her mate will be. And when she chooses, the others leave. So I don't know the specific answer to that question. Uh, once she makes her choice, the others know and they, they leave. So I, I don't, if this goes on, I don't know about it. Thanks, Janet. If you'd like to ask a question over the audio, um, uh, th thank you everybody for very, very positive comments. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and you can uh, verbally ask it or if you're more comfortable, you can also write it in the chat and I can just ask Janet herself. And then the third option is you can always email uh, either myself or Janet. Um, if you email me, I can pass on the question, Janet. I'm sure she'd be more than happy to answer that question for you. I have a question. Uh huh. Janet, how did you get interested in coyotes? 13 years ago, I met my first coyote up on Twin Peaks. Uh, and uh, I guess I'd heard that there were coyotes here uh, in the newspaper in 2004. And uh, uh, I hoped to see one. I've always loved wolves. Um, and then in 2007, I was actually walking my dog and um, a little a coyote came up bouncingly, very excited. And uh, you know, there was an intelligence there. 
a personality, a communication, something I'd never seen in wild animals before. And I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. And I vowed to find out more. And the more I found out, hey, the more pulled in I became. Thanks, Janet. I have a question from Stephanie Gallinson. Um, what is the best practice when a coyote is actively following me on the sidewalk when walking with my dogs? Stephanie says, I cannot walk away and approach the coyote menacingly at the same time. This happens regularly on a residential street. I have large dogs. Please. Yeah, and I know Stephanie. So um, keep, keep walking away, but also uh, possibly pick up a little uh, inch and a half rock. Don't hit the coyote, but throw it at that coyote's feet and just let that coyote know you don't, you're not going to tolerate this. And that's all you can keep doing. Uh, possibly you could walk in a different area. Uh, um, maybe you're getting too close to home. I don't know. But the main thing is keep walking away from that coyote. That coyote will stop following you at some point. But um, if you want him to stop from ever coming back, I don't know if that's possible, except un uh, unless you take a different route. Go ahead. Janet, I have a question for you as well. Uh huh. So you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that um, <clears throat> you believe and you had verification from the associate of the trapper that the um, first coyotes were brought to San Francisco intentionally. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have any sense of why that trapper would bring coyotes into the city. So it's a convoluted tale. And um, I gained all this from a telephone call from this uh, intimate associate of the trapper. And he was mad. Yeah. In, in 1998, uh, the liberals of San Francisco voted to ban leg hole traps in California, I guess in California. And um, this was a trapper who used leg hole traps. And he just wanted to get back at the liberals of San Francisco. He didn't realize we would all love the coyote. <laughs> so and, and, story. Yeah, and Janet, they, they came from Sonoma County. Is that right? Or was it Mendocino County? M Mendocino County. Um, uh, Dr. Benjamin Sachs is the one who did the study, and he is uh, only saying they came from the north. He's not saying that they came from Mendocino County. However, the trapper is from Mendocino County, and uh, um, so that's that's where they're from. Thanks, Janet. Um, uh, Christine, I want to acknowledge your suggestion to include this on Nextdoor SF Gate. I know Janet will be, uh, I always encourage everyone to also go to Janet's website, which I think is very informative. Um, Janet will have a lot of content I'm sure she will share. Um, and so I would, uh, I will follow up with you, Christina, on that uh, excellent suggestion. I have another um, uh, comment uh, slash question from Penelope. Penelope says, I live on Telegraph Hill and have a five pound dog. Several times now we've had a coyote not only watch us, but follow us, closing the distance to a mere yard in spite of our holding our dog, moving rapidly away and making loud noises. What do you suggest? It sounds like this is a very similar uh, question to the previous one. Yeah, except for the dog is small. Yeah, pick up that small dog. Coyotes have grabbed dogs, especially during pupping season. And uh, if you want, as I say, pick up a small rock, uh, not big, uh, inch and a half is a good size, and heave it at that angrily at that coyote's feet as you keep walking away. The main thing is keep walking away from that coyote. So just about all I can tell you, possibly again, take a different route. Um, so that, you know, I mean, it could be that route that is where the coyote is. Thanks, so Jen. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. I'm the person that just asked that question about my small dog. It's not even about taking a different route. I literally can come out my front door and I have had two coyotes and one time three that are around the car, hiding behind the car. And all we do is get on the sidewalk and they have come from behind the car. So why don't you go out without your dog 
and just really with your body language, um, angry with uh, rocks, noise, and throw it at the feet and let them know, you know, and do this several times. Let them know you're not going to put up with this. And, but do it without your dog. And um, uh, do you live, like, do you have a hose by your house? No, no. Because uh, putting on a hose full blast on a coyote will kind of do the same thing. You know, it's so, not, my, we're right there at Grant Avenue in Francisco. And I would say they're out probably every other night. You know, that's their territory. And so we'll scare them away, but then boom, they're back. Um, let me think about it. I'll, I'll, uh, try to come up with an idea. I'll also talk to some other, uh, people who might have some ideas, but, um, have you varied the time you come out? Let's see, Grant and Francisco. They're coming straight down from Telegraph Hill or they're coming up Francisco dead ends and they come up that hill at the end. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right in the middle of their territory. It used to be any time from about nine o'clock till one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So do you have to go out at night? Yes. So I mean, that's it's more about just being wary, but I wondered if you had any more specific suggestions. And at this moment, no, except for to vary your time and not go out at that time. So that's that would be the best thing. They are out at night. And uh, uh, those particular coyotes, especially mom, is pretty forceful. Yes. Uh, her, her pups aren't yet, but they'll get there. And uh, yeah, just avoid those coyotes. Um, Thank you for the question, Penelope. Um, I, I, just a, one last call for questions. Thank you all for the really positive comments. Jenna, um, I don't know if you can see them, but uh, it seems like a lot of people found this very helpful and um, I, can, I can share some of these comments with you. But uh, one last call for questions and I apologize again for starting late. I uh, take full blame. Janet was early um, and uh, just had some technical difficulties. So appreciate everyone's patience uh, through all that. Um, and of course, thank you, Janet, for your time and sharing your passion, your expertise. It was, I, th I found it very, very helpful and very informative. And um, thank you all, especially for willing to engage in the discussion and appearing today and uh, listening to this discussion. I think it's um, half the work in helping uh, understand how we can preserve these, these wonderful creatures is learning more about them. So thank you to you all. And of course, thank you to Janet and Judy uh, for all, all your hard work in organizing this and putting this together. You're welcome. <laughs> With that, um, I, I wanna make sure I can give everyone their time, their evening back. Um, Janet, thank you again. Um, I'm gonna end the, the, the presentation now, but um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email myself or Janet, of course. Um, I will make sure to get that to Janet, of course, as soon as possible. But thank you again, everyone, and uh, really wishing everyone a happy holiday and a happy new year. Thank you, Janet. Thank, thank you. Janet. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. That happy was great. New year. Happy New Year. That was great. Thank it was you. fantastic. Thank you.